Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Joe Torrey. I'm one of the investment counselors here at Real Wealth. And today being Halloween, we're having, I believe, our ninth installment of the Halloween Investor Horror Stories. And this year, the theme is lawsuits. And I'm joined by Clint Coons of Anderson Advisors, our longtime legal resource. Clint, can you hear me okay? Joe, I can hear you just fine. All right, great. So uh, we'll have a few housekeeping items to go through. If we can advance to the next slide, and then we'll get started with some horror stories that investors have experienced. All right, here's our standard disclaimer. Oops, two slides forward. Too fast. Yeah. The strategies in this presentation may not be appropriate for everyone. Other options not mentioned may be more suitable for your specific circumstances. Okay. Consult your personal accountant, tax advisor, and or attorney like Clint to discuss your specific situation. And as always, past performance is no guarantee of future results. Real estate purchases are subject to investment risk, including the possible loss of amounts invested. And while every effort is made to maintain accurate and current information, the possibility of errors and or updates always exists. So that's our standard disclaimer, mostly for property presentations, but for today's purposes, the key thing is that nothing that we say today should be construed as legal advice uh, for your situation. Uh, laws vary from state to state, and we don't know what your situation is. So this is an educational <clears throat> webinar uh, outlining the broad principles uh, in the law, and uh, Clint will take us through those. But if you have specific uh, concerns, you should uh, talk to Clint's people and uh, get specific uh, recommendations tailored to your situation. All right, just an intro about what we're doing. Uh, first, we're gonna uh, introduce the in uh, presenter, Clint Coons. Then we're gonna go through four horror stories. Uh, the first one is a real estate related scenario where an investor owned real estate and got into trouble. And then second story is something that had nothing to do with real estate, but his real estate uh, portfolio was put at risk for a different lawsuit. Then we'll talk about a, an investor who relied on an umbrella insurance policy and it didn't work out. And then finally, a scenario where the investor did something tried to do the right thing, but didn't quite do it completely. And we'll go through a summary of the uh, takeaways and then open it up for Q&A. The questions, you can click on that orange uh, arrow on the upper right-hand screen, type in your questions. The questions we want, though, are questions that apply to everybody, just the generic uh, kind of thing that would interest everybody on the call. Not If you have some specific scenario about what happened to you, that would be a time to uh, talk to Clint's people uh, offline. So we want to keep the questions as generic as possible. All right, Clint, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with me. You've met me at the pa in the past, or you've been on one of the events. Uh, I'm an attorney with Anderson Business Advisors. I was one, I'm one of the founders. I started with my partner, Toby Mathis, and uh, we work with individuals all over the country, that is Anderson does, to help them create structures around their real estate investments. And our approach is typically threefold. We want to make sure that uh, we're reducing your taxes and we're creating asset protection. But at the same time, we're we're building a business. We're, we're balancing out the asset protection, the tax planning side to help you actually achieve your goals and do more. Because with entities, I've definitely seen it. It's helped with my own portfolio. My partner, Toby, and I, we invest all over the country and we have a sizable portfolio in, in addition to having single family, multifamily, self storage, uh, commercial properties, we also actively flip real estate as well in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So, so we're quite involved in real estate. And so the entities and the structures that I talk about are the same things that uh, I'm using in my own investing <clears throat> to propel it forwards and those of our clients. So in a nutshell, that's a little bit about Anderson. Oh, by the way, I should share with you this too. So. Um, at Anderson, it, it, again, if you're not familiar with us, we bring both the tax and the legal side together. So we have CPAs, we have attorneys that work inside of the firm. Uh, we have about 450 employees here just domestically. And on our global side, we have offices in Singapore, Hong Kong, Switzerland, UK, uh, where else are we at now? Cayman Islands, Dubai, and uh, there's a thumbs up in, in Spain, and uh, we're still continuing to grow. We have about 60 employees on the international side uh, of our firm now. So it's been quite a journey and I'm glad to be here today. Great. All right, let's get into our first uh, horror story. Okay. 
All right, this was a real estate related scenario. What happened here? All right, so in this one right here, the first one is about, uh, has to do with a um, housing or a, a contractor that came out. So one of our clients that we're working with, he needed to get some work done on his roof. So he hired this contractor and the contractor told him, well, it's gonna be a few weeks before I can make it out there to start on this project. Well, those few weeks, you know, drug on and ended up being close to a couple of months before he came out. Eventually he did come out and he brought a helper with him. And that helper went up onto the roof and the helper happened to be the contractor's brother-in-law. Now the brother-in-law is a diabetic and the brother-in-law had stopped taking his meds. What I understand is that he ran out of money and so that's why he was going out to help his brother-in-law on this job to get some money, possibly to go out and buy meds. But anyways, he, didn't have, he was not on his meds. And as he was working on the roof, which by the way, he was too obese to be up on a roof to begin with. Uh, while he's up there, he passed out, rolled off the roof, and with all that weight that he was carrying, landed on his head and he died, he broke his neck. Now, unfortunately for our client in this scenario is that that contractor, when he was out there working on his project, did not have a valid license. That his license had lapped, he hadn't been paying uh, the necessary dues. And so my client, our client was stuck in this situation now where he had an unlicensed contractor out there performing a service on his roof where somebody died. And so then the next of kin turned around and sued. And the, uh, I believe the state also got involved uh, in this particular action against him. And unfortunately, when I say he's our client, at the time we were not working with him, everything he had was in his own name. And so he experienced you know, firsthand the what can go wrong when you own real estate in your own name that you would never envision that this type of claim would come against you, a wrongful death claim. I mean, it's the worst one you could ever have, but it has serious financial ramifications that come from that. So of course, what we did afterwards is we looked at his portfolio of his other properties and we drew out a strategy where we're gonna take each of those properties and make sure that we put them into limited liability companies to get them out of his name. So in the future, if something like this did occur, it was the LLC that would be sued and not the individual. Because as the individual being sued, he wanted to get out of this case. So he was willing to sacrifice assets to make the case go away. Beyond just his policy limits, he was willing to sacrifice assets. That's the first horror story that we have here on today. That is a terrible horror story. So why was he liable at all? Is it because he hired a contractor that didn't have a license? Didn't have a license, wrongful death that occurred on the property. Yep, just brought it all back to him. Um, okay. You know, and, and, it, and unfortunately, I've seen a few scenarios like this before. No, it's not in the in in the deck here, but uh, a, a physician decided to quit and go full time into real estate. Again, it was that idea of not understanding or appreciating the risk that can come from operating heavy machinery, having people out there, and his brother-in-law. Similar story, but. He was the one that killed his brother-in-law when he was out operating an excavator and he clipped him in the head because he wasn't paying attention and it sued him, put him into bankruptcy uh, mm -hmm. in that scenario. So, you know, these are things that, that happen. Uh, of course, when you own real estate, there's risk involved there. Uh, falling off roofs is not uncommon. It happened to my father with one of his painters uh, fell off a roof and, mm -hmm. and, that, and, and the exact same thing occurred. Was not licensed okay. uh, to be up there. And uh, when you say uh, put it in an LLC, uh, are you saying, do you, you recommend one LLC per property or have one LLC per state with multiple properties in it? What are the pros and cons? So I prefer to set up one LLC per property. And it used to be, if you, if you saw me speak 18 years ago, 15 years ago, in fact, in my first book, Asset Protection for Real Estate Investors, I advocated for putting multiple properties into uh, one LLC, and I would I would base it upon equity. I'd say, all right, so what's your total risk exposure here? It's three hundred thousand dollars with the three properties. That's your equity. If something goes wrong, that's how much you're going to lose. And that thinking was tied up in this mindset that we invest. You know, we're trying to protect our equity. And it wasn't until my investing personally took off, and I started buying a lot of single family homes, that I recognized the fact that hey, I'm not buying these single family homes for equity. That's not why I'm buying them. I'm purchasing them for cash flow. 
And so when I had three properties inside of one LLC, then there are three rent checks that are coming in every month that I'm risking. Okay? The equity, I don't need the equity. I can't live off the equity. I can't use the equity to say, hey, oh, you need to re-roof the house? Tell you what, let me just rip off some of my equity coupon here in this equity coupon book I have, and I'll give that to you, right? No one's going to take that in payment. So I need that income. And I, and then, then I started looking at what we were recommending. I said, you know what? This is this is the wrong way to do it. We want to make sure we're preserving the income that comes in from our real estate investing. And so if we put one property per LLC, then the most we would lose, like in my example, where someone fell off the roof, they sue the LLC, you lose the property, you lose the income associated with it, but you save the income associated with all these other deals that you have. Because the income is what allows us to, you know, change our lifestyles. Maybe a spouse can quit their job, you know, and send your kids to school, retire early. All that's important. That's why we we invest, or at least that's why I invest, and a lot of the clients we work with invest. And so that's why I would say one property per LLC. Okay. All right. What's our second horror story? All right. So the the second horror story we have here has to do with a uh, uh, physician. So this physician, uh, she's in in Oregon. So she's uh, she's driving down the freeway on I-5 in Oregon, and we just started working with her probably about four months before this 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 harm occurred. And she had a lot of real estate. She has a lot of cash. Her and her husband, they're actually they're both uh, professionals. And we had been reaching out and saying, "Hey, we well, need to get your entity set up. We need to get your assets protected." And she kept saying, "Oh well, my husband and I, we know it, but um, we're we're struggling right now with the name." for the LLCs. And so she has these assets, but nothing was moving forward to protect her assets because her and her husband could not come up with names that they could agree upon for <laughs> these LLCs that we we're going to set up. And there's probably nine or 12 LLCs. I don't recall the exact details on how many. But I receive a call one day. And I get on the phone with her and she said, I need your assistance right away. And I said, what do you mean? What, what happened? She said, well, I'm driving down I-5 and there's this accident in front of me and I slam on my brakes. And my car, you know, I drive a Mercedes S-Class. It stops, no problem. And I didn't hit the vehicles in front of me, but I'm being sued. I said, well, you didn't hit anybody. How are you being sued? It's because it's the truck that was coming behind me that could not stop in time, hit my car and propelled it into the three cars, or the car in front of her, which was part of the accident. And she said, now they're turning around, the people in those three vehicles, and they're suing me. And I don't understand why I have any liability here. Well, it's not the fact that she, you know, does she have liability? Well, they're gonna find liability because her car ran into them. And yes, you can argue that there are intervening factors there, that the truck behind her was the one that created the harm. That, that caused the accident that pushed her car in. But at the end of the day, what do these plaintiffs see? They look at the cars that are in the line. They see beat up old Dachshund truck. They see uh, a Buick. They saw another you know, car that's only worth a few thousand dollars. And then they see an S-Class Mercedes. That's the person we want because they have the deepest pockets. So they're, they're, they're coming after her now. She's been served notice and she's going to be sued. And she wants to get protected. And at that point in time, unfortunately, all of her assets were in her name and in her husband's name. And she thought that she could just magically now create the plans and we could take those assets and put them beyond the reach of her creditor. But I had to explain to her, I said, at this point in time, we have these assets at risk. If we started to take action and start moving these assets beyond the reach of your creditors, understand that they may argue this is considered to be a fraudulent transfer. And if they consider it to be a fraudulent transfer, then what they could do is undo all of this uh, and put everything back in your, no, your own name and have access to them. So in that particular case, what we want to do is we want to make sure that, you know, of course, she should have set that stuff up sooner rather than later in, in this scenario here. And what I would have done for her, not only would I protect the assets like we talked about, you know, placing the assets into LLCs. The other thing that we would do uh, for someone like that is ensure that we have a Wyoming holding company set up. And so when I set that up, I'm going to go to whiteboard here real quick and just draw something. I'll show you what I'm saying. So we set up a Wyoming LLC down here. This is the first entity we create. 
And then for each of the asset holding LLCs that hold property, we have all of the, these LLCs holding the real estate owned by the Wyoming company. And the reason why I do that is that I want to ensure that my physician client, when somebody's looking at her, they don't see all of this stuff right here. All of that remains hidden from their creditors. And so the Wyoming LLC allows us to do that because it blocks her relationship to those entities. And a great example of this is that um, three, no, actually it's been five weeks ago. Five weeks ago, there was a couple here in Washington state that uh, active real estate investors, I met them at an event, uh, actually it was an event limitless where I saw uh, Rich and Kathy, they were down there as well. And uh, I, met, I ran into this, this, this couple there and they said, hey, can you help us out? We've got a lot of property, we need some protection. I said, okay, well, here's what I'd like you to do. I need you to give me a, fill out a strategy session questionnaire that lists out all your assets, or you give me a financial statement, prepare something, and so then I can start creating a plan for you. And I need to know any entities that you currently have. Well, they were all ready to roll and put a plan into place, but then they went radio silent on my assistant. And they kept saying, oh, we'll get to it. We've been really busy. I know Clint needs this information in order to have a strategy session. So I decided to take it upon myself to do some research on this couple. And in about 30 minutes, I discovered the 11 entities that they had created in every piece of property that they owned. And the way I was able to do this is that I went to a website called opencorporates.com. And on opencorporates.com, what you can do is you can type in an officer's name. So I could put in your name. And that's what I did with this. I put in her name and I put in her husband's name. And open corporate searches all 50 states for any information that where that person will be tied to an entity. So I found an LLC that they were tied to, that they were listed as the manager of this limited liability company. It actually happened to be a Wyoming, uh, no, it was a Nevada limited liability company that they were, they were tied to. Once I discovered that, most people might say, well, then you found one LLC. Well, then I took the LLC name and I put that into the database and I said, tell me every LLC or business entity that the existing company I found is listed as a member of. And then I found 10 other limited liability companies. So I unraveled their entire structure in a matter of about 30 minutes. And then it was just a matter of just doing a property search um, through data tree to determine each piece of real estate that was held by these various companies. And I sent that to them. And I got an immediate response back. Who shared this information with you? Basically, I said, Google did. I go, that's how easy it is to find out when you set up a structure, if you don't do it the right way, to protect yourself. If I was a creditor coming after you now, you're an open book because I can find all your assets. So using a Wyoming LLC and setting up the right way, you can have a sizable portfolio, you can have business entities, but none of it will trace back to you. And that's why we typically start with that as our first entry. Okay, so a question that comes up a lot is about California-based investors. Uh, California has a rule where they have to pay, you have to pay $800 per LLC to California, even if it's not a California LLC. Yes. Can you explain that and how to get around it? Okay. So there's different ways to work around the California $800. Um, one way to do it is to use a blocker entity called a Wyoming Statutory Trust. Okay, we use that as a blocker entity that holds all your outside interests in various LLCs. And so everything, like when I, when I showed you on that, go back to the screen. So what you saw here, if I was in California, resident that I was dealing with, I would make this a Wyoming statutory trust down here that would own these. So maybe this property here is in, this is a, a well, Florida's a bad example. Say Ohio, this is in North Carolina, and this one's in North Carolina. They would all point down to the statutory trust. So the statutory trust serves as a blocker entity here, and it keeps you from having to file the 800 for all of these out-of-state entities. Because in California, of course, they want to assert that you pay $800 on every LLC that you hold an interest in that you actively and also you control. 
So we want to stop that by putting this blocker entity right here and we say, hey, you don't own an interest any longer in LLCs. You own an interest in a statutory trust. The statutory trust holds the interest in the LLC. And when you're investing in California itself, there's other ways we can do things. We can do a land trust in California, do a Wyoming LLC like this. We could set up a, a California W, or we can set up a WST that holds the California property. So we can just use a straight up Wyoming statutory trust to hold California real estate. That's another way to avoid the $800 on that. Uh, disregarded limited partnerships are ways to work around it. But what I tell people a lot of times when it comes to California, in, in structuring it, you know, paying the $800 to set up an LLC there to hold California real estate, it's not that bad at the end of the day to pay $800 on this, on this deal. Because you look at the relative uh, rental income you, you generate from a California investment, most clients that I work with, when I ask them, how much does your California property bring in? 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand, something like that on an annual basis. Okay, and how much do they want? $800. So, so when you look at what the cost is to set up the LLC versus what you're protecting, I think it's just a cost of doing business and it keeps things simple. I mean, we can get creative, we can do all these other planning, but at the end of the day, I, I like to tell people, if you have to work with banks, you're gonna be working with lenders, getting creative to save $800 may not be in your best interest because it's gonna, we make it more difficult for you to get your deal over the finish line. And ultimately right. that's what we want to do. So it can yeah. be done. We do it all, all for a lot of people, but I also, you know, think help caution people. I said, Hey, sometimes simplicity is better, even if it costs a little bit. Yeah. Well, our investors are mostly based in California, but they own properties outside of California. Absolutely. So your first yeah. scenario works, but does anybody else do that? Any other state charge $800 besides California? Well, they don't, no, no. Uh, oh. I mean, they have franchise, Tennessee. Uh, so Tennessee is its own little animal when it comes to uh, for setting up the structures there to avoid franchise tax on rental real estate LLCs. That's a, that's a big one we have to plan yeah. around. And in your scenario here, uh, she was a target she had a bullseye on her back because she had an S-Class Mercedes. Does it help to look poor? Does it to look poor? Yeah. yeah well, so, so that's actually one of the strategies we tell people is that, you know, own everything, control everything, but own nothing or appear to own nothing. Mm -hmm. That if you look like you qualify for food stamps, nobody wants to go after you. And there's ways to do that with your structuring that you can take your assets and, you know, you get them out of your name. So if somebody looks at you, like what happened to one of my California clients uh, last year, he had a judgment entered against him, personal judgment, $1.7 million. Wow. Now, his net worth, easily over $30 million. He walks into the debtor's exam, and they did not know what he was worth. They could not figure this out going in, that he had any assets. And so as a result of going into this exam and what they eventually did find out, he was able to settle that case for under $400,000. I mean, he walked in thinking he had to pay $1.7 million. He walked out writing a check for less than four hundred dollars because they realized the complexity of the structuring that eventually that they found out about was not worth going after this individual because they were never going to get paid. And, and so when you're thinking about structuring, you want to look like you own nothing going in because most of the time you don't even have to go in because they'll drop the case. But if you do go in and they are able to find out what you have, then they realize, hey, we got a judgment against someone who is judgment proof based upon the way they've structured themselves. And so now it becomes a matter of, can we get something rather than mm. nothing? So that's how it works. Okay. All right. And uh, so you should drive a Chevy instead of a Mercedes. Yeah, definitely. The other okay. mistake people make too with, with cars is uh, if they have young children, you know, teenagers, and they're going off to college, having your name on the vehicle that your child is driving mm. uh, brings liability back home too. We've had a few clients have to go, unfortunately, been through that scenario. Uh, one that I talk about quite a bit, bankrupted. And they, after they had retired, because their son was involved in a car accident, where they were, the parents were listed as the legal owner. Oh, okay. All right, what's our next scenario? All right, the next scenario here. 
is the umbrella insurance policy one. So here's one of the things that I hear, uh, I mean, I hear this a lot from attorneys and other individuals that are not up on asset protection, deal with a lot of real estate investors. They tend to encourage people to take the approach of buy enough insurance and you're covered if anything goes wrong. And in fact, we had uh, one individual that we've worked with now uh, going back a few years. He was out there, he was buying the policies, excess liability policy, umbrella policy, just on top of his general liability policy. And he thought he had everything buttoned up that if anything you know, happened with his rental properties and somebody came after him, insurance was there to backstop it. But that was making an assumption that the type of claim that would be brought against you is something that your policy covers. And, and my experience in, in working with the, the clients that we do that invest in real estate, many times the claims that are brought against these individuals are not type that are covered under their policy. And this individual found this out unfortunately the hard way when he evicted his tenant for non-payment of rent. And of course the tenant's not happy uh, that he's getting kicked out of the property. So the tenant decides to remove the washing machine that the tenant owned because the tenant installed it himself. He went out and bought a washing machine, put it in this, this rental property, but the tenant didn't know how to install a washing machine, obviously he found out because when he attached the hose, the water hose to it, he, the gasket, the rubber gasket that goes into the um, female end of the hose, well, it had fallen out. So the water was leaking, small leak, and that was small leak had built up and he created a toxic mold problem. So the wall behind the washing machine was just all covered in black mold. That wall was the adjoining wall to the bedroom and it seeped through and you had mold now in the bedroom where the tenant was sleeping. So when the tenant removed their washing machine and they saw this, they automatically or, or all of a sudden developed an acute case of toxic mold poisoning. Didn't exist while they were living there, but when you see the mold, now you have it. So they turned around and they uh, sued this individual who was the insurance king when it came to owning policies, but not one of those policies uh, stood up to defend him because there was a specific exclusion in every policy for environmental contamination. Toxic mold is an environmental contaminant. And so he was left uh, in that scenario you know, to, to deal with it. So what should you learn about this? I mean, this is another reason why um, we, we talk about LLCs and separating out assets, one property per LLC, is because if this, when this property is in a limited liability company, the claim gets brought against the LLC, not against you as the owner, because the LLC owns the property. And if the LLC only has that one asset, then the total recovery for the plaintiff will be the equity in the asset itself, because there's no policy limits for them to take at this point in time. It's only what they can get from uh, the equity if they force that property into a share of sale because they get a judgment against the LLC. So it was a, it was a bad scenario for, for, for that particular investor. Of course, in, in toxic mold or those types of cases, you know, there's a little cottage industry that has been developed around suing landlords, property owners over toxic mold. And I've heard horror stories, especially uh, in California and in other states where attorneys will go to buildings where they have one tenant, and they find one tenant with toxic mold, then they'll go and try to find other tenants in that property, canvas a building to find more potential litigants uh, to bring these these actions. Or they'll just you know, send form letters to people making uh, threats to landlords that they're going to sue over toxic mold just to get people to pay up because they realize their carrier will not cover them. You want to make sure you're protecting yourself uh, from this. If you've invested in any state that has uh, any type of humidity, you're going to have mold. If you've got a bathroom and a house, most likely you're going to have some mold build up in that bathroom. Because people don't use the fans like they should when they when they go in to take a shower. I remember our daughter when she was young, she was in high school. Literally, you, she'd open up that door sometimes from from her bathroom. There would be a cloud that would follow her out because she'd sit in there for so long with the water hot and singing and just steaming that place up. I mean, you walk in and you couldn't see anything because there's so much steam in the bathroom. 
I mean, the, those are issues where we're we're mold created. Got to be careful. Okay. So what the what are some typical things that are not covered by umbrella insurance policies? Well, what you're going to find it's not going to be covered many times as a real estate investor. You know, all right. So if, if your tenant has a dog, uh, depend on the type of dog that they have. That's not going to get covered in the event of a lawsuit. Discrimination claims that are brought uh, oftentimes for, for, for landlords not renting property to a tenant. Um, if you, again, those, those same types of claims uh, can be brought if you refuse to renew leases um, for someone or wrongful eviction cases that are brought uh, by tenants who are kicked out of properties. Uh, the other thing you have with real estate is always going to be contract claims, contractual claims. They're not going to be covered. So there's a, a lot of issues beyond just the normal slip and falls that will come up uh, as landlords that we need to be uh, concerned about. And so what I've seen more and more is a lot of right now is the, the discrimination type claims that uh, are brought on the front end hmm. for, for failure to rent the property to someone. So should investors have an umbrella policy at all as an extra layer or? You know, that yeah, I don't think there's a problem with it to, to have it. Um, I think it's always a good thing. And so what I would look at is finding a carrier that will issue with this type of policy over all of your LLCs. Because that's a struggle that, that investors run into is finding the carrier to give them the umbrella, but that umbrella policy covers more than one limited liability company. Oftentimes they'll say, "Well, we'll do an umbrella, but if you have a, uh, if you have six LLCs, and it's only going to you have to buy six different umbrella policies." But there are carriers out there that will give you an umbrella over all six LLCs. They don't pay. Okay, good deal. All right, what's our last horror story? All right, so this one right here almost did the right thing. Uh, let me see if I can move this forward. Back up. All right, so here we have um, real estate transfer taxes. So in this particular case, he, this investor was uh, gone to an event, heard about you, you know the importance of investing in real estate, decided to get started investing in real estate, bought a house. And then at that event, he was introduced to a, a company that helps set up asset protection. And so he transferred his property into an LLC. So this, this group, out of Utah recommended to him that he set up a limited liability company to own his investment real estate. Everyone that owns you know, investment real estate, he was told to use this limited liability companies for you know, what I was discussing, asset protection purposes. So he deeds this property directly into the LLC. Now, what he didn't realize is that by transferring the real estate into the limited liability company in Florida, it's a unique state. In that in, in Florida, they will assess transfer taxes based upon the mortgage on the property. So if you have no mortgage, a transfer tax is not a concern for you in Florida. But if you have a mortgage on your property, then there will be a transfer tax based upon that mortgage amount. The other problem you run into in Florida is that if you've had owned property for a while, uh, then in and of course a property has appreciated over time, they impose or they allow you to cap the rate of increase on your property tax. So if I've owned a piece, uh, an investment property in Florida, let's say for five years, and now I decided to transfer it into a limited liability company, my tax rate, uh, if I bought it for 200,000, it might be taxed currently for, for property tax purposes, the value may be 260. So I'm, I'm assessed at $260,000 on an annual basis. The reality is, the property itself may be worth $575,000 if I were to sell it because that property tax cap that they have in Florida has kept my taxes at, at no more than 10% annual growth, even though the property has been taken off values. So when you move that property into an LLC, you reset the taxes and they automatically then step it up to the 575. So you get the double whammy of, a, you have to pay a transfer tax and you have to pay more in property taxes. So the way you solve this issue, if you invest in Florida, and that's why I mentioned this earlier with the uh, when we were talking about LLCs, 
you want to use a land trust in because the land trust is immune to those problems that I just brought up. And the benefit of using a land trust in Florida is that it offers asset protection. So typically if you have property in Florida, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this property and determine, all right, is there a mortgage on it? So if there's a mortgage on the property, then we're gonna put that property into a Florida land trust. Right, it's gonna move into there. Now. If there is no mortgage on the property, no mortgage, the second thing we want to look at is when did you buy it? Purchase date. Okay. And the reason why I want to know that is because depending on when that property was purchased, you know, if it was five years ago, what's its current tax basis? Okay. For property taxes. If there's a huge discrepancy, here's your tax basis 260, but it's currently valued at 575. I don't want them to step me up to 575. So I'm going to use a land trust then. Now, if neither of these hold, I bought the property, uh, say, six months ago, and I have no mortgage on it, well, then in that circumstance, you can put the property into a limited liability company in Florida because we don't have those tax issues. So when you're structuring Florida real estate, in my example, you have to be careful uh, and you have to evaluate these to determine, do you go this route or this route? Uh, the one thing I would share with you as well on the land trust strategy, and we use land trust in all 50 states, so it's not just Florida that we use. Typically what you'll do when you put a property into a land trust like this, you'll then have the land trust owned by a separate uh, LLC down here. That and what they're gonna do. Now the reason we do that is because we wanna ensure that, of course, if anybody came after you, they can't get your land trust from you because a land trust interest is not protected from creditors, they could take it. So we want to use the charging order protections that LLC provides. And the other reason why we, we structure land trusts into LLCs is that with the exception of Florida, that provides protection, meaning if someone sues a land trust, they can't sue you personally. If I'm using a land trust outside the state of Florida, they can always sue me personally uh, if I'm the beneficiary. So I never want to hold an interest in a land trust. I want my LLC to hold it. So I can't be sued for what happens on the property. Okay. I think I got most of that. Next slide. Okay. Oh yeah, the, that's a list of states and which ones have this transfer tax. Of the uh, world wealth markets like Texas, Indiana, they don't have any. Ohio has a minimal one, 0.1%, Tennessee, yeah, of the real wealth markets, it looks like Florida is the main one to worry about this tax. Florida is the main one to worry about um, down there when you're moving property, and that's why you want to look at using land. All right. Great. Okay. All right, let's wrap up. So, um, you know, here's some takeaways to consider. You know, we talked about uh, one property per LLC. Consider using a holding company for anonymity, and um, there's a lot of other benefits that come from that as well, in addition to asset protection by having that blue box holding LLC down there, owning all your various real estate LLCs is really important. From that standpoint, you can make your tax returns look better as well if you structure it as a partnership um, for, for uh, tax purposes. And so all around, there's, there's a lot of benefits that come from using that type of, of planning. And then the other thing I would tell people is just to make sure that you're you're aware of the the rules in the state where you're investing, okay, to when you're transferring the real estate in, because there's always different options. You brought up Texas, Joe. You know, maybe in Texas we're looking at a series limited liability company for someone rather than a traditional LLC, just creating independent cells for them. So real estate investing is not when it comes to asset protection and tax planning, it's not a one size fits all approach. You, you want to make sure that you're looking at the property, where it's located, your income level as well, what you intend to use, how you intend to use that property, short term, is it long term, um, and then build the plan out. All right, great. Well, thanks a lot. All right. And then, so if you can advance uh, to the next slide, we have questions. We can start. Yeah, here's a way of getting a hold of uh, Clint and his team. You can visit that link 
uh, uh, aba.link rwn 2024 or scan that QR code uh, and get a free strategy session with one of uh, Clint's people. I work with Kelly Allison over at uh, Anderson and she's great. Yeah, guys, you know, you just uh, reach out, we'll set up a free strategy session with you and we'll sit down and we'll have a discussion. We'll look at your assets, we'll help you build out a plan. And if you want to want to work with us, we'd be happy to bring you on as a client, help uh, protect your assets and look for ways to reduce your taxes. But if you have someone else you want to work with, hey, no problem. Uh, we're looking at building relationships and we hope to win your business. But we'll start by creating a plan for you and showing you what we can do for you um, with our strategies and our, our asset protection uh, planning. So with okay. that, you wanna get some questions? Let's get some questions. Well, a, a first question is uh, like, how, how often does this really happen? Like if, uh, if you have a thousand clients who have real estate investments, how many of them get sued over the life of their uh, portfolio? You know what? Not a lot, thankfully. No. Not a lot. Um, and I tell people that I said the likelihood of being sued is probably pretty small um, when you think about it because if you're a good landlord and you maintain your properties, then why are you going to be sued? Um, but it does happen, and it's the it's the one-offs. You know, for example, about five months ago, one of our clients called us up and they said, "Hey, I'm being sued right now. I need to make sure my entity, you know, the property is held in the name of this entity. Well, why are you being sued?" I was doing a remodel and the guys that were putting, the, the contractor was out there, was working on my kitchen countertop. He got in an altercation with the two guys that were delivering the fridge. They showed up a day early and then they ended up, they started this fight and the guys that had the fridge dropped the refrigerator on the con, the contractor who was doing the uh, countertops and he just demolished his leg, broke it in three different places and they're suing him. Okay, uh, for this. And so those are the types of things that you just, you can't predict. And, and so having that structure in place, you know, is going to compartmentalize that risk and it's going to allow you to sleep better at night and give you some peace. Right. So it's kind of a low probability, but high consequence event. If it does happen, you're, you're wiped out. <laughs> Correct. Okay. All right. Some questions here. I can't read the name, but can you move an investment property to an LLC when you have an existing mortgage? And if so, do you have to get permission from the finance company? Great question. Okay, so here's what I tell people. First off, if your property is owned by Freddie or Fannie, you can move it directly to the LLC without having to get permission. Okay, because the underwriting guidelines permit you transferring real estate into an LLC. How do you know if your property is owned by Freddie or Fannie? Really easy. Google Freddie Loan Lookup Tool. I'll take you to a... If you, See this, uh, the link comes up, click on it, takes you to their website. You fill in your information on your property. You put in your social security number. You put in your name as the owner. They'll tell you whether or not they own, they own that mortgage. If, it, if Freddie doesn't own it, then check to see if Fannie owns it. Now, if one of them owns it, you're good. If neither one of them owns it, then you're probably better off transferring that property first into a land trust, like I talked about earlier, I said, we still use land trusts outside the state of Florida. Here's why we do it. To avoid the lender accelerating a note. So if I'm working with a client that has a property that has a low mortgage or interest rate mortgage on it, and it's not owned by Freddie or Fannie, my first um, reaction when they want to get structured is, we need to do a land trust. We'll put your property into a land trust so we don't run the risk the lender accelerates this note, and then we'll put the land trust so we have that protection. The okay. Um, next question. If you are in a trial and the judge asks you if you have any assets and you say no, as they're because they're held in LLCs, is that lying? Well, you always must answer the question, and you have to. So when you ask me, do I have assets? Well, yes. Membership interest in an LLC. So you just have to listen to the question. If they ask you, do you own any real estate? Correct. My answer would be, no, I do not own any real estate. Okay, Because I don't. I own entities that own real estate, but I don't. I wouldn't clarify. They would have to ask the clarifying questions to get that out of me. But you'd never want to lie. Okay? Right. Remember your answer. Cool. 
Okay. Uh, does Anderson do litigation? No, the we do members not engage get in litigation. You do not. Okay. Yeah, typically, if that happens, uh, you should talk to the property management company of your property or the property team. And, you know, like if you have a property in Cincinnati, you talk to the property manager there and they know uh, who the local attorneys are who can help you. Yeah, and the thing about the uh, litigation side, you know, if you're a platinum member of Anderson and you were found yourself in litigation, we would speak with your local attorney that represents you in that litigation matter. And oftentimes where we're brought in is from the business planning side, the, the attorney wants to understand more about the structuring that was done, then determine, you know, what should be disclosed uh, when there's there's discovery requests that come in. So, so from that standpoint, we have helped our clients before in working with their local counsel that represents them, but we do not represent them. Okay. Uh, do you recommend setting up an LLC in the state where the property is and then having a Wyoming LLC above it? Generally speaking, the answer to that is yes, I do. Um, that's how I would uh, recommend. Okay. Well, I guess this one doesn't matter. What is Clint's ratio of successful versus not successful defensive property owners? Yeah, you know, I, I can tell you this, that I've had, uh, that I've personally worked with a few clients that have been involved in lawsuits. And uh, I can firmly state that probably 80% of the time they walk away just with having to pay their policy limits on their on their insurance policy. And they don't come out come out of pocket at all. And that's driven by the fact that the opposing counsel is looking to get paid. And so they don't see assets, they'll settle it out and, and then um, give them a full release. Or if they do find out what they have, they realize, hey, it's just not even worth going out. Okay. Uh, is there any scenario where you, you hire a contractor that does have a valid license, uh, but still uh, the investor can get sued if the contractor gets injured? Well, you, yeah, you can always be sued in those situations. If they say assert that it had something to do with the property itself that created the harm, um, then they're going to bring you in. Okay. But it has to do with the contractor's negligence, and you're not going to be. All right. How much uh, administrative overhead does an LLC require, especially if you have 10 or 12? Is there a lot of paperwork and annual filings, that sort of thing? So, so that's a misconception. There, a lot of individuals believe that, you know, if I, I'll take this best example I can give you is my mom. So when I uh, was sworn in as an attorney, my father looked at me and I went from indentured servant, helping him on all his real estate ventures uh, since I was growing up. He looked at me and goes, oh, all right, great, permanent retainer for life. First order of business for you, now that you're a sworn in attorney, is you need to protect all of our real estate because it's going to be yours one day. That's the way my dad couches. So he wanted me to create uh, an LLC for each of his properties. <clears throat> now, my dad telling me to do this is one thing, but I, he's not the one that manages the real estate, you know, pays all the bills and handles that. It's my mother who does all the bookkeeping. So I went to my mom and I said, listen, you know, dad wants me to create these LLCs. I just want you to understand that we're going to be transferring the properties into the limited liability companies. And first she thought, well, what does that mean? What do I have to do different? And I told her, I said, nothing. Okay. Everything stays the same because I'm setting the LLCs up, the disregarded LLCs, so they don't have to file tax returns because she was worried about that. She'd have to file all these tax returns. You don't have to file any tax returns. Um, I, I do want you to open up separate bank accounts. Uh, for these properties and the various LLCs. And the reason I want you to do that is it's going to be because right easier for her to compartmentalize it, although she didn't need to. She could still run it through through one management structure. But I said, the work is going to be the same. You're still going to track your expenses and your CapEx and your income that's coming in on the properties. And then on an annual basis, she said, well, what does that mean? What do I have to do every year? I don't have to do anything. Okay, I will remind you when you have to renew your entity. I'll tell you, this needs to be done. So you just have to file one piece of paper with the Secretary of State on an annual basis. She thought, how about the meetings? No meetings, nothing. 
So I did that for them about 20 some years ago, and they're still running the structure to this day. And if, if I say, if my mom can do it, uh, then I think anybody can do it. It's, it's not a lot of work. Okay. Uh, related question, does an LLC give you any tax advantages? An LLC does not in and of itself provide any tax advantages that you could not obtain on your own if you own the property directly. But what an LLC can do for you, depending on how you structure it from a tax standpoint, we're talking rental real estate. here. Um, if you set it up as a partnership, the blue box that I, that I drew up there, if that's set up as a partnership, what it does is it changes where the income hits your 1040. And when income from real estate, let's say I had 10 properties, that all flows through a partnership tax return, it cleans up my 1040 so that I don't have a bunch of Schedule E schedules carrying a bunch of individual real estate uh, investments on it. Instead, I have one line item that shows my income or losses from my overall real estate portfolio. So why is that beneficial to have a, a 1040 that shows one line item with everything captured there versus having a whole bunch of Schedule E's capturing each individual property. It comes down to audit risk. You reduce your risk of audit. And as you take more uh, opportunities to reduce taxes through cost seg, bonus depreciation, uh, things like that, salary depreciation, then if someone's auditing your return, looking at your return, they, they're not up on this stuff, they may flag it for audit. But when it's run through a partnership, you have very few individuals who are capable of auditing those returns. So it reduces your overall risk of audit with that type of structure. And this is validated by CPAs, it's validated by attorneys, tax attorneys that we have that work for Anderson, used to work at the IRS, I'll tell you the exact same thing. It also helps you with borrowing. So if, you, if you're new to investing and you've made some acquisitions in the past year or two, then when you go to obtain another loan, you want your income to flow onto your 1040 through a partnership rather than having that real estate income flow directly onto your 1040 because you own properties, disregarded entities or in your own name. Because oftentimes the underwriter you work with to get your loan is underwriting with Freddie Fannie guidelines. And under Freddie Fannie guide, lending guidelines, if you have a property that has less than two years experience associated with it through owning it for the rental income, then they need to hold back 25% of your income from that property for vacancy. Because they don't see that there's not enough track record there to, to show how, that, how well that property is gonna perform over time. So they can't rely upon all your income. Now, the reason why that's important to us as investors is that as we grow our portfolios, we have a debt to income ratio that starts to sneak up on us as we're leveraging assets. And so we wanna make sure we're showing as much top line revenue as we can from our investments. So it can also help you on the borrowing side by treating it that way. The tax standpoint, it's neutral. Right. Yeah, because most of them are passed through entities, right? Correct. Now, if we're gonna create a corporate, or set it up to be a C corp or an S corp or an active business, well, yeah, then you're gonna have some tax benefits. Okay, well, let's, uh, we have a few questions here, but they're all very specific to somebody's situation. So uh, for those people, uh, scan the QR code or visit that uh, link there and uh, make an appointment to get a free strategy session. You can ask your questions there. And uh, Clint, you also have a YouTube channel, don't you? I do. How do they find yeah. it? Just... Well, if you just type in uh, Clint Coons Asset Protection, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find it's Real Estate Asset Protection is the name of the channel. Um, but yeah, I, I drop videos, couple, two videos a week I drop, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I respond to all the comments that, that people post on my videos. So if you want to educate yourself more on, the, on this topic, I invite you to, to also check out my YouTube channel. Uh, I probably have several hundred videos there on different aspects of asset protection and business entities and how they can be used. And I've also been doing a lot of, or not a lot, but I've posted a few just on the Corporate Transparency Act, which if you haven't yet done it, have a business entity, make sure you get your beneficial ownership information filed for your business entity. We're coming up on the end of the year. My experience with the governmental systems, 
everybody starts hitting them because they're behind, they forgot to do it, start to crash. You don't want to be one of those, they say, oh, you failed to file your BOI report, obtain your FinCEN number for your entity, now you're going to get fined $500 a day starting January 1st until it's filed. Make sure you get it done. Yeah, could you expand on that Corporate Transparency Act? Nobody asked about it, but that's that's important. I had a bunch of LLCs I'd set up 15 years ago and forgot all about them, but I had to get them dissolved and um, file that form you were talking about. Yeah, so so federal government wants to tra uh, track all owners of business entities, and so they've put forth new regulations um, that require anyone who has a business entity to obtain a reporting number for it, number one. And when they're obtaining their reporting number, they have to provide all of the beneficial owners information. So whoever has an ownership interest in that company, and actually there's more of you, manage it to be reported as well. Um, you need to provide your social security number, copy of your driver's license, home address, so they can track you. If they feel that your entity is engaging in money laundering activities, that's the reason why they set up rules to track entities. Now, that information is not publicly available. Uh, it is completely private, but they do require every business that has been set up or going forward to complete a report on that business entity by December 31st. And uh, I hate to tell you how worse it's going to get next year. Because by December, I think it's 15th next year, then property transfers are doing the same thing with real estate transfers starting next year in December. They're going to be tracked. If you take any real estate and it's transferred to a business entity and it does not involve financing through a registered bank, then information on the transferor and the transferee and the transferee entity must be reported to them. So some things in the work for next year that they're just collecting the kind wow. of information. That's scary. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Clint, for uh, providing our members with such great information. Hopefully they can use the information here to avoid being in their own horror story. Uh, for those of you who are listening, uh, you can scan the code there or uh, visit that link and set up a session with Clint's people. And uh, that concludes this year's Horror Stories edition. See you again next year. Thanks. Hey, thanks for having me, Joe. Take care. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.